Yeet. Friends, I'm going to start soon. Just going to find my water bottle. Excuse me. My thing on. Getting ready to go. Gotta make sure I actually record it today, otherwise there will be sadness. I should have my lecture starting. What's going on? Oh yeah, there's seven people watching, cool. We're on top of it. Definitely a few people tuning in. Ah, really excited to be back. 205, exactly. Uh, at kind of 16. No, I don't want that to be sent. Deleted. Turn to my OB Studio page. There it is. We are almost ready, 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 ready to go. Who is here? Should be streaming on YouTube as well today. Um, hope that is working. There are a few changes with Restream while I was away, so I'm not 100% sure that that is uh, functioning in the same way, but I think that you folks can figure it out. Go back to my first page. Oh, with my um, my iPad and my little remote control. Just a minute. We'll start in one more minute once I find my remote control. Tablet remote. Uh oh, not that one. What's this computer called? Cool. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm going to hide myself. Folks, welcome back. <laughs> I am so pleased to be back hanging out with you you all uh, here for week 10. Week 10 in Comp 1720. Whoa, that's very loud. Um, just making sure all of my stuff is here. I know that my... Uh, I wish there was a way to pause that video. I just don't want to use overwhelm myself with my bandwidth. 
<laughs> um, yes, I've been away for a little while um, on parental leave, um, which has been really fun. Of course, it's a wild ride for a new baby to arrive, um, but you know, there's many exciting, wonderful experiences to be had there. Um, as a reward for coming to the live lecture, I'm just going to produce a baby picture and put it in the chat. Where is my baby picture gone? There is my baby. Putting it in. I, it's a class material now, apparently. So important class material. If it ever bothers to finish. Um, that is a picture of my baby who is sleeping, which is an important and sometimes rare occurrence to have my, uh, her sleeping. Um, <laughs> I, she is not in the house right now. She and, and my wife are, have gone out, but they might be coming back here soon. I'm often lecture from home, which is where my studio is. So hopefully when she comes back, she decides she would like to go to sleep. If she comes back and she decides she doesn't want to go to sleep, we might have a problem with doing lectures from home, but we will see how we go with um, some, uh, with having this whole <laughs> working from home bizzo. Not quite so easy to work from home when there is a little person who likes to scream when they're not asleep, hanging out with you. Welcome to week 10. Now we're going to do a, a few um, admin things about the major project, which is what you should be mainly focused on. And then I do have a lecture. I've got content for you today. Um, and in fact, in the lectures for the next three weeks, we're not gonna stop giving you content just because you're working on a major project, right? You're doing this um, course to learn about making interactive artworks with P5. And I'm going to talk to you, and Tony will talk to you on Fridays, about interactive art in P5, about interactive art more generally, and we'll be giving you things that hopefully improve your knowledge of this field, which, which is what you're here for, and hopefully some things which you can reflect on and maybe work into your major project, even if they're at the last minute. I suppose in week 12, it might be a bit too last minute for that, but um, we will provide you with some, some content that is um, useful or interesting, or you might might find uh, helpful for you. So today's lecture, the topic of it, the P5 topic is working with data um, in your P5 sketches. It's a, a really fun topic, which is where um, kind of the drawing stuff, all the drawing stuff, looping, data structures, arrays, objects, all that stuff you already know now in P5, and you've had lots of experience, starts to pay off when you can grab a really big data file with some interesting data to process and use it to drive your interactive artworks. So I hope that you um, still have some room in your brains at, at week 10. I know this is like the really nasty end of the semester for many of us. Um, week 10 is when there's like final assignments, final projects, exam prep, things are starting to really ramp up. Um, I hope there's some room in your brain for some new content. Um, at least it'll be a little bit more chill than our lectures before the uh, mid-semester break, which is, or in the um, spring break, which is when I last saw you. I last saw you in week six, I can't believe it. Five weeks ago, so seems like a long time. My life has certainly completely changed since then, having a first kid in the house. Okay, let us continue with the lecture. Admin, I'm back, Charles is back. Um, thank you so much to Kieran Brown for contributing three lectures um, as a, um, you know, a casual lecturer for the course. He is someone I really uh, respect as an artist. Kieran is a wonderful artist, a wonderful digital artist, and I'm really pleased that you had a chance to listen to him um, talk about this course. He's also a great teacher for Comp 1720, but at the moment he's writing his PhD, so he, he decided to not be that involved this year with the course. We have a course survey that um, your course reps, Ben and Jarvis, are running. 
you can find the link in the chat. I hope that Ben and Jarvis post it in the chat again right now. But they've done it. Cool. Um, fill this out by Friday. I think the story was they only had a few people filling in the survey so far. And it would be really great if you could spend the amount of time it takes, which is probably around one minute, fill out the course survey, just tap a few bits of information in there. It gives us a good indication of how the course went compared to the first part of the course, early, early indications of how you're going to go, and the latter part of the course. There's not much we can change in the course at this point, but it certainly helps us understand how people found the course, particularly now that we've moved online. Um, it's going to be very important. Also, um, I think it's probably CELT time. If you've got a CELT for this course, please fill it out. It really helps us to, to design courses better. And as I said, every course of the ANU has had a huge overhaul to work online. So filling in your evaluations and giving us feedback as teachers is really important for future students. The rest of this course is now focused on the major project. Your whole life in 1720, apart from the two hours a week you spend listening to myself uh, and uh, Tony talking about art and interaction, should be thinking about how you're going to make your major project, getting started, getting it done. Major project details are on the course website. They're up there on the course website. Um, I know that last week, Kieran did a quite a long um, read through of everything in the, the major project. I'm not going to do that today, um, but I do have a few little slides and suggestions on a few topics. You'll do it. I'll do another few slides and suggestions next week when we're getting closer to the submission date. The thing to remember with major projects in this course is that although now you have experience doing three assignments for us, your three assignments were worth 12.5% each and your major project is worth 50% of this course. So it is four times the weight in the assessment and we expect something which has much more effort and polish than regular assignments. Now what this might mean in practice is that for many of you, um, you may have found that the assignments didn't take too long. You only had to spend um, a few hours um, working on one. Maybe you'd spend a few hours one day and then the next day look at that again and update it. I know some people spent a lot of time on the assignments, but um, this is more the, the vast majority of, of students who have many assignments going on at the same time. I understand you need to slice your time up th slim, thinly. The major project is not like that. You need to have a few good sessions over the coming weeks, a few iterations, a few sketches to get a really good result, okay? It does need to have more effort and more polish than a regular assignment in order to get a result which you'll be happy with. We are here to help you do that. We have already been helping you to do that by forcing you to do a storyboard, forcing you to get into your labs and discuss it, look at ways that you can use all of the course content to your advantage, um, and we're not going to stop. So I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Another way that we're sort of dragging you all into getting started with your major projects and giving us as many opportunities to give you feedback about your ideas as possible before the deadline. Major projects. This is a picture from a previous year. I think it's from 2018. In the good old days when we were in person, we did have a major project exhibition or a showing night where everyone could get together look at our major projects uh, and really have a good time examining um, what everybody else was doing. Um, many of you folks are not in Canberra or on campus. Um, so even if we had such a thing, you wouldn't be able to come. And I've been thinking about whether it would be possible to have an in-person gathering um, at the moment. And even though some of our, our gathering restrictions are being loosened or, or less restrictive, it's still quite a serious matter to get people together at the ANU. And I think the advice is still to not do it unless it's absolutely necessary. So we will keep evaluating that over the coming weeks, maybe the next two weeks and make a call. But at this point, we're focused on our major project exhibition being online, an online experience just like you've been enjoying so far. We've given you a, a view of what this will be like with the little galleries for your assignment one and assignment three. By the way, if you haven't seen the assignment three gallery, there's a link in the forum, um, but we can't quite do the same kind of easy,
gathering that we used to, just getting everybody together in a big room and, and looking at assignments, which is a bit sad, but I think we just have to play by the safest rules. So the goal of your major project, let's just take this back a bit. What are you doing in your major project? What's the goal? Make an interactive P5 artwork for a new media art exhibition. So this means that your artwork should be something which could be displayed on a big screen connected to a computer on a wall in a gallery with a keyboard and mouse attached and any other peripherals you need. So someone walks into a gallery, walk, 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 they look on the wall and they see your artwork. And they can walk around this gallery and they may interact with your artwork and they may not. So your artwork that you create in your major project has to be something that will actually draw their interest and make them want to interact with it. So your goal as an artist here is to provide them with an engaging experience of a roughly three minutes exploring the project theme. And that experience is not going to happen unless there's something about your artwork which makes the viewer want to interact with it. So something you'll do in your labs this week is imagine what your artwork looks like to someone who is not interacting with it. What if people don't even bother? So you do have to have something about your artwork that makes them want to, to press um, get up there and figure out how it works. So that's one thing to think about with the goal. The theme, fearful symmetry. We had many uh, great discussions about the theme so far in your labs and in lectures. Um, you can interpret the theme however you like. I would be careful about substituting a different theme in place of fearful symmetry. So I, I've heard some student, seen some students' uh, ideas for their, their project and they say, well, my theme is you know, something else, like maybe some kind of aphorism like, um, you know, a watched pot never boils or something. And I'm like, well, what does that have to do with fearful symmetry? And so maybe like the idea is, oh, you can see your reflection in the watched in a pot on the stove and that is the symmetry and I'm afraid it won't boil. It's like, well, kind of, but maybe you should do something which is more about the theme and not something which is more about the theme that you wish it was. So just be a little bit careful that you're actually focusing on on what we require you to do, fearful symmetry. Overloading your artwork is not gonna make it easier uh, or more engaging to, to the audience. A few things we're gonna talk about today, two things. One is this, this new statement. So you've done artist statements in your artworks so far, and now we have an interaction statement. So for the major project, you must write an interaction statement as well. And the interaction statement is a bit different than the artist statement. It's a step-by-step -step discussion of the experience you want someone to have. So they walk into the gallery, what do they see? Or they look at the gallery on the website, what attracts their attention to your artwork? What are the meanings of what they see? How do they interact? What are they supposed to do? How do they know what to do next? So this is for each major step of your, your interactive artwork, if there are steps, explaining everything about it in, in quite clear terms. And the idea of the interaction statement is that you are telling me, the examiner, how your artwork works so that I know what it does. Okay? That's very simple, isn't it? You don't want me, the examiner, to miss things in your artwork. Your interaction statement is, is a chance for you to tell me what I'm supposed to be seeing. And then I can evaluate how the success of that, which hopefully is extremely, extremely good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, so interaction statement versus either statement, they're a bit different. The IS is really a message to me, the examiner, whereas the either statement is a message to the viewer for explaining what you're trying to communicate as an artist. Um, they're not the same thing. The IS is about what the viewer will do and the AS is what you're trying to communicate in your work. So they're quite different. Your interaction statement is again something you can start early. Many of you may have discussed these things in your labs. Start them today, great way to explore ideas. Now, here's your challenge with the major project. Your first deadline for the major project is not the end of the semester. Your first deadline is next week because I want you all in this class to make a start on your project. That means fork the repository, clone the repository, get it on your computer, 
sketch some aspect of your project out, no matter how small it is. Something from your storyboard, something from your idea, sketch it out in P5 and have it done by Monday. And then you'll be doing a visual diary about it this week. So you'll need this for your week 11 labs. I put the week 11 labs, uh, updated the week 11 labs page with an explanation of what to do. I literally don't mind how small this sketch is. It could literally be a, um, a object or character in your project or a, a demonstration of, of some aspect of the interaction. Any aspect of your, your project, no matter how small, it just has to be done in P5 committed to your repository, pushed up to GitLab, and written about on the forum for your visual diary this week. Last visual diary in week 11. There's no week 12 visual diary. So that's a bit of a different challenge, but I don't want, basically, I don't want people to be writing visual diaries about architecture, movies, games, whatever. I want you to be working on your major project. <laughs> so use your visual diary this week as your major project and you have to do it. <laughs> so um, this is your week 11 work. We didn't have week 11 work in the labs last year. It was sort of a different format because the labs were in person, but I think it's much better if we have a structure for it when we're online. And I think this is something, this will be very, very valuable for many of you who tend to you know, leave things until the last week because you know, there's other assignments and stuff, but just make a very small start here um, so that I don't have to panic in the last days that people haven't started. Now, yes, so read this page. Week 11, it's different. <laughs> code theory. This is today's code topic. <clears throat> it's not a huge code topic because um, we've done a lot of work in P5 already. I don't have to explain everything from scratch. But here's, here's what it is, working with data. What is data? <laughs> What's data? What is data or data or data? Here's a, a picture of a tube. I suppose it's one of the tubes from the internet and there's a bunch of ones and zeros all next to it. I suppose this is something we think of when we think of data or like information superhighway. When I was a kid, that's what people were calling the internet. Information superhighway. Just, yeah, this kind of stuff. Here's a kid. Surfing the internet, <laughs> cool stuff. This was like all over the, the news whenever people were talking about computers in the 90s, like we're gonna have data moving between countries in, in big ways, information superhighway. Yeah, anyway, that's a bit of a, <laughs> a wacky, uh, wacky time. But this is not what I want you to think about when you think about data. I want you to think about some more pragmatic stuff. So, oops, here's an example of some data. A spreadsheet. Here's an example of some data. A text file with the complete works of William Shakespeare. And the point of what we're gonna do in today's lecture is ways to take data like this, files that contain information that you could be using in your artworks in P5 and get them into P5, access this data so that you can make something artistic out of it. So we've been working with data already. You know how to add variables, arrays and objects into your sketches and you do that by typing them in, right? And having maybe a bunch of variables getting set up at the top of your sketch organizing all of your, your important information. I've seen some of your assignments, some people having really detailed arrays of data um, of where they're placing every object in the screen. But what if you wanna use a lot of data? Maybe you, you wanna have not just 10 or 100 pieces of data to read in, but 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 or a million, then it's going to be a little bit much to store it all in your sketch.js file. I suppose you can do it, but it will be really weird. It would be better to have it in a separate file and then load it into p5.js. And a second question is that on the internet, there are many kinds of websites where you can access data about stuff. For instance, you could access weather data or bushfire data or data about transport, data about roads, 
all kinds of interesting data that you can access from different kinds of institutions or government uh, organizations. Can you get that data directly into P5, right? You don't have to save it somewhere first. You can just get it into the sketch and make some cool art with it. And the answer is yes, I'll show you how to do it. So this is our data lecture, getting these things in to your art. So three steps for data art. What are these three steps gonna be? First one, getting it into P5, either as a, some kind of array or an object. Then we will access different elements of this data and then draw, move, sound stuff on the screen based on the properties of the data which we load in. So these are the three things we'll talk about today. So the first kind of data we're gonna talk about um, is something like a spreadsheet. So um, we could call like the, I got more abstract idea of a spreadsheet as a table, right? A two-dimensional um, data source where there are rows and there are columns. Uh, you can make spreadsheets to, to contain this kind of data, right? In Excel or Numbers or Google Sheets online. Um, but you can't load an Excel spreadsheet into P5. The kind of table um, data source which P5 can read is a file of this type called CSV. And CSV stands for comma separated values. And it's just a plain text file with a CSV file extension, right? Nothing special about it, just a normal text file. So you can easily make your own in VS Code just from scratch, or you could export one from Excel or Numbers or Sheets if you had some spreadsheet of cool data you wanted to look at. You could export that as a CSV and load it into P5 and make an artwork out of it. So that's what we're gonna have a little go at. Just to demonstrate, here is a simple table, demonstrate how to do this, um, of I suppose animals down here, and then some numbers. This is just a, a table in HTML, so it's ended up formatted in this slightly strange way on the screen, but that's okay. And then if we wanna make it into a CSV file, we would just do the following. All the strings get little um, quotation marks around them so that it, P5 knows that it should be a string. Then everything else is a number and between each value we have a comma, comma separated values. Then each row, it starts on a new line. So each, each one is uh, the same number of values. One, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five. Now, this is all well and good. This is a perfectly valid CSV file. Um, the only problem with it is that we don't know what the numbers mean. So often when you're making a CSV file, you might add a one row at the top, which is gonna be the header row, and that will just give a label for each column. So this column here, well, it's pretty obvious that that's animals. This one is numbers, this is numbers, this is numbers, this is numbers. We don't know what those columns are. But if we add this extra header row, Oh, I've added in the kinds of numbers. So I made up this table, but it's a representation perhaps of animals that I might see on a walk near my house. Maybe I would see 12 kangaroos and that each kangaroo has two legs and two arms or four limbs and zero wings. I might see one echidna if, if I'm lucky with each one of those that would have four legs, zero arms, zero wings. One time I did see sugar gliders, which was pretty special. I saw three. And they, I guess, have four legs. I don't know if their front paws also seem like legs. But they also have two wings, which is weird for a mammal. Uh, noisy miners are a kind of annoying bird. And I'm likely to see between 100 and 1,000 noisy miners around my house. And then magpies. There are no angry, swoopy magpies near my house, but uh, I think they're all been um, nicely fed by the local people, local gardens, giving them lots of bugs. So they're all nice to us around here, um, unless you're wearing a bike helmet, in which case, woe be you. <laughs> woe to you who wears a bike helmet underneath a nesting magpie. So how do we get this kind of file into, into P5? Well, what we might do is take this text, copy it out, put it into VS Code in a new file, save it with a .csv file name, and put it in your assets folder, just like we do with all our other assets. 
And then we can use P5's load table function to get this data into P5. This is what it might look like, data equals load table, assuming data is a, a variable already. Load table, assets slash animals dot CSV. Then we tell it what type of file where it's going to load. There could be other types of file. Sometimes you, instead of using commas to separate the values, you can use a tab, that would be a TSV file, tab separated values. I think it supports some other options, but these are the ones we're talking about today. And then we give it this other parameter header, just to say, the first row is the header, <laughs> otherwise it wouldn't know because there's no difference between this first row and all the other ones. It might just think that that is a regular row, but the first row is special. So then this returns a table object, um, a P5 table. Just have a little look in P5 at what this might look like. Oh, sorry, my screen is probably going back to low resolution. There we go. I've got my, where's my animals um, CSV? I really want the one with the header. There we go, animal, count, legs, arms, wings, kangaroo, echidna, sugar glider, noisy miner, magpie, cool. Now, that's not the right file, animals header. So I first load the table, and then I'm just gonna get into setup here and actually just see what we've got. <laughs> You know, when you don't know what you've got when you're programming, sometimes the best thing to do is to try printing it and then you can find out what you might have. There's my sketch, just get the console. There is my object. So I've got an object which has some columns. It has some rows. I didn't, didn't load the header, whoops. There we go, now my columns have worked out. Sorry, that's probably really tiny, but it does say columns, animal count, legs, arms, wings. So it knows about the columns. This object has all the rows and inside each row, there is another object which is containing the values of that row, kangaroo 12, 2, 2, 0. So let me get one of my, access one of these rows. Maybe I'll do um, data dot, or print something. Print data dot get uh, row. I'll get the, um, the first row is the zero row, zero, one, two, three, four, five, number one. And that will give me an object. And then I'm going to get it's, uh, yeah, get its animal because it, the object it comes with within this table has animal, has all the column names attached to those values, which is really handy. So I can get row one dot animal and see what happens then. And I get, oh, undefined, really? What did I do wrong? I'll see what I did wrong on the next slide when I remember how to do it properly. Whoops, using P5 tables, here's how we actually get this stuff. Oh, there's some other, other method you're supposed to use, whoops. So I should be getting a row, that'll get me a whole row. I can get a whole column by name, and then if I get a row, then I have to get the value from that column. Let me do that properly. Don't get. Animal. Oh, got it, echidna, cool. So I can access bits of information from my, um, my animal table that I loaded up. Another thing that you could do with a table in P5 is just change it into an array if you found that easier. So this P5 table object includes a function called get array, which will transform it into an array. In that case, you won't get your column names, um, which you might have liked. It just, you just end up with this two dimensional array, then you can access each element by index. 
you know, there are, there are pluses and minuses to both approaches, but um, if you wanted to just iterate over rows and then get information out by column name, then just going with this first approach might be a little bit easier. I kind of appreciate, I've been playing with this for a few days, just figuring out how P5 does this. And I think that this P5 tables object is a little bit weird. And if you do want to use it, if you do want to use it, you probably have to actually read the re reference um, explanation of how you're supposed to use this table object. Um, because it wasn't quite clear to me um, what you were going to get out of it. But that's okay, you know. Um, this was, P5 was designed with certain assumptions in mind and also trying to use JavaScript. So it, it's just a little bit confusing um, of how to use these tables. And of course, you can change a table once you have it, remove rows find a row, match rows, do different kinds of queries. It's quite advanced, I guess, in that, that respect. We won't go into great detail about it though. What I want to do is just do a little bit of a more complicated example. So writing your own CSV file is, is one thing you can do. I've certainly done that to create artworks in the past, get some data I wanted, put it into a CSV file and load it into my, um, my program. But another thing you can do is find CSV files online with interesting data. And one I found which was kind of cool was this worldcities.csv. So there's a um, page called simplemaps.com which will offer you a Creative Commons licensed um, CSV file with um, about 26,000 of the most important cities and locations in the world. So 26,000 rows in this file. Obviously something which is a little bit complicated to put inside a JavaScript file unless you're loading it in separately. Let's have a look at it. I've got it right, oh, where is it? World Cities, there it is. Here it is. <laughs> so here's my header row, city, city, ASCII, lat, long, country, etc. First city is Tokyo, second is Jakarta. It's got some cool data about each one. Um, sometimes it has the population some of these cities it has population, some it doesn't have population for, which can be a bit of a bummer, but it does its best. And yeah, so we might do a little bit of a city artwork right now. By the way, I haven't heard too many questions, but uh, yeah. I'll show you a city artwork. So instead of loading up the animals, I'm going to get my cities. By the way, I'm using the preload um, function in my sketches today a lot. Um, sometimes when you're loading data, particularly if you're loading it from the internet, it might take a few seconds for a browser to actually download it, or a few milliseconds really, but long enough that if it wasn't there, your setup and draw functions would be broken. So something that we do is to put things into preload. You've probably used this to load up images or MP3 files, which will take a while for the browser to download. You can also use it for a big table, which will um, take a while for your browser to download as well. Uh, there's oh, worldcities.csv. Cool, and what I might do is instead of Uh, background 255. I might just try to make a world map with all these cities. How about that? So, um, var num cities equals data dot. Oh, get, I have to look at my reference. Get row count, I think. Get row count. Yeah, that's the number of. Row count. Okay, that's the number of cities in my my uh, table now. I might I'll just print one to see what's the data is going to look like. Data dots gets row zero. Twenty-six thousand five hundred forty-two cities. First one is Tokyo. There we go. 
So for each of these cities, I want to draw a little dot on the screen. So I'm now going to iterate through all of them. I'm doing this all in the setup function actually. I'm not going to use the, um, the draw function right now. I might show you a demo later of something I made with it. Uh, I less than num cities. I plus plus, our typical uh, for loop structure. So I'm going to take a variable i, go from 0 all the way to 26,500, whatever it was, to look at every row in the cities. So I'm going to get the var lat, latitude and longitude will be data dot get row i dot uh, get lat var long equals data dot get row i dot get long. Okay, so now I hope this works. Oh, it seems to be working so far. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> I'm going to be drawing some dots here. Now, if I draw an ellipse at this point lat long, I don't think I'm going to have much of a impact in my sketch. It's not going to look right. Oh, whoops. Uh, oh, whoops. What should my objects look like? Obj, lat. Hmm. Was I doing the wrong thing? <laughs> I'll look at my, my worked example. Oh, get, oh, I'm just going to get it in one go. How about that? I'm just going to get by um, both column and value at the same time. I'm doing something very wrong. I wonder what I've done wrong here. I thought I was doing good. I thought I was so organized class and now I'm very much not organized. I'll get my worked example and bring it in. Um, Ellipse. What have I done which is so bad? It must be something good. I'm just gonna comment this out and do it for one for zero. If you don't if you find yourself not able to get something to work, try it for zero and then let's see if uh, that will be the expected outcome. Print lat print long. Hmm. Zero. Done something bad here. Well, I want to keep going with the lecture, so I'm just going to show you the cool example I made before, <laughs> which is cheating, really, isn't it? But there we go. Here's another example. I'll figure out how I got that the little dots to work before. But this example is drawing kind of a world map except with little lines. So. Each, um, in each frame, it takes a bunch of world cities and then draws a polygon between them. So you kind of get a world map, but it keeps changing all the time. Um, it's a, just a 
interesting way to try to visualize this data. You can get a really nice world map if you just pinpoint all of those, those latitude and longitude positions kind of mapped across the whole canvas. But I want to do something a little bit different. There's a good example for how to do this in the Getting Started with P5.js book, which I've been recommending to you folks for a few lectures. But this is one example. I'm going to move on because I wanted to tell you about some other stuff before we get to three o'clock. So I will. <laughs> so another way of, of getting data into your um, sketches is to load a object directly stored as a text file. And there's a way to do this with JavaScript called JSON or JavaScript object notation, which is literally just a, a text file containing all of the data within a JavaScript object. Um, they have .json file extensions. You can make them again with VS Code. You can just uh, save them from P5. There's a way to save an object as JSON. And it's a really common way of sharing data between websites. So we'll be using JSON for the rest of the lecture. Um, we'll get to the website bit in a minute, but here's an example of a JSON file. And it should look similar to what you know already because it's very similar to just writing an object in your code in P5. Like here would be the, the properties and the value, property, value, property name, value. And the little curly brackets means you've got an object. The only, the main difference here is that you have to put quote marks around the property names and you can't do everything you can do in an, in a, uh, an object in uh, JavaScript. You can only have properties, they can only be string, numbers, arrays, objects, or booleans. So there are some limits to JSON, but it's still very widespread. It's a very important data format and you can use it to um, drive an artwork, get a JSON file, load it up, drive an artwork. It looks very similar to doing the, uh, the load table system that we had before. So instead of load table, you say load JSON. In this example, I've just used this, uh, this existing very simple JSON file. Maybe that would be called mammals.json. And then we could say data.weight and that would give us 61.5, that property. I find this kind of easier to deal with than p5.table actually. I mean, I just screwed up a p5.table example in front of you all. So you can see what I, that I think that that's a little bit of a hassle. Um, there are some weirdnesses about load JSON in, in p5 as well, but it can be useful for grabbing a big data file and getting it together. Is everything going okay with my streaming? Yeah, I think we are. I was just wondering for a minute. So I haven't heard from you folks in the chat for a while. No one wants to ask a question? Oh well. So a little practice go just in one minute. In my um, sketch, I've got a, we'll get rid of this. I'm going to load JSON instead, load JSON. And I've got a JSON file here called MoMA Artists. Okay. And I can just print data and see what I've got. Let's have a look in this file. So you can see this is a a long file it actually starts with an array, but that's kind of interpreted incorrectly in P5 as an object as well. Uh, and then each of these objects, what this represents is a big file of every artist represented in the Museum of Modern Art um, in the States. So it's a very long, uh, pretty large JSON file, a couple of megabytes, and it's just a lot of artists. And we could do some art with it if we wanted to somehow, but I'm just going to access one of them to show you what you could do. First I'll just start by printing. I'll just dispose of that and get our, my window again. I did tend to lose my, my windows. It takes us a little while to actually load something. Oh, it's something wrong here. Moment artist. Oh, it's the wrong. I've done what many people do, which is to forget assets. 
I put it in the assets folder. I need to put assets slash there so I can actually find it. Here we go. Here's my MoMA uh, artist. And it's a big object. It's actually so big that it's a bit hard to view it in the browser. Now I've kind of crashed the browser. Oh uh, wait, okay. No. I'll just get the first element and have a look at that. First elements, elements number zero, and I get this list of all the things going on there. I could find something, maybe I want to see what the nationality of this artist is. Prints dot nationality. And it says American. So now I can have this big data file that I can access. And what would be cool would be to perhaps draw this on the screen. So maybe I'm going to take data zero dot nationality and draw it somewhere on the screen. If it worked, where'd it go? Well, maybe I should do uh, fill zero stroke zero. There we go, American. Oh, it's very small. Where's my canvas? Okay, so I got this, this one artist drawn somewhere on the screen. Maybe I could make an artwork with many more artists and show you that. I might do something like that at the end. Um, but as you can see, I'm just interacting with this, this very large data set, just like a J JavaScript object, because it is one now. I loaded it in from a text file. Now I've got a huge JavaScript object with all this information in it, just ready for me to go and make a cool artwork with it. Now, the... Let's get, skip that. Let's have, have a look at the big picture here. Why are we doing this again? The idea here is to use data to drive an artwork as a way of connecting your art with the real world, right? So of course you can invent a lot of things for your artwork, craft different locations for things on the screen, but one of the cool things about computers is being able to um, transmute or synthesize other kinds of data and turn them into something else, um, convert things, transcode things, um, and Use this to create, using this to create art is one of the foundational ideas of new media art. Um, there's an artist, or, yeah, artist and author called Lev Manovich who's sort of set out the, the main ideas of new media art. And one of the main ideas is taking one kind of data and turning it into something else to give you another, another sense of that data, give you a view into it, or use it as inspiration from some other kind of artwork. So if you store this data outside your program, then you can access it when you need it. And it's particularly useful if you've got a huge data file or you want to curate something very carefully, maybe in Excel and export it as a CSV, then you can use that as an asset in your work. The final thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is how to use P5 to load data directly from the internet. And this is pretty cool. This is where I get to um, not have to use VS Code and I can use the P5 editor because I don't have to store an asset. I can just get it directly. The browser goes and fetches it for me from somewhere else. So the topic here is something called web APIs, getting data from the internet. And you might think, web API, what does that mean? What is API? Well, I'm here to tell you that API means application programming interface, which is incredibly unhelpful as a, a definition for this word. It's almost useless for us as, as interactive artists to, to know what those, that word means. But practically, what a web API is, is it's a property of a website whereby a website has a special system of URLs where 
P5 or any other program can go and get data from it directly in a way that your program can understand rather than a human can understand. So normally website URLs return you a web page which a human can view through a web browser, but we want some URLs which produce JSON data instead of this web page so that P5 can just read it and know what to do with it. Um, by the way, not all web APIs return JSON data, but JSON is by far a extremely important and widespread format for how this works. Why do this at all? Well, I suppose we could cut out the middleman. We don't have to save data on a computer. You could, of course, just save the JSON file. You can enter a, P5, uh, a web API address on a browser. You would get the JSON file, download it, save it in your folder. But if P5 grabs it for you on the internet, then it will always be up to date. And in fact, you could make a, an artwork which changes from minute to minute because it keeps reloading an API with different, um, different queries or different time periods. This is the final thing that's really cool about APIs is that you can actually program the kind of data you get with special query parameters in the URL. So some websites support different ways of accessing data. Here's a little example. This is very boring right now. It'll be more interesting in a second, but the special URL is gonna be this. It's too long to read out, but I'm gonna break it down. The first one is called the endpoint. It's just the, the main part of the URL. And then there's a question mark in here, right in the middle. And then there's some other stuff. So everything before the question mark is sort of the main part of the website. Everything after the question mark are some parameters that you're giving to that website. And for this particular website, the first parameter is resource ID. I found this from a, um, a website that explained how to use it. This was an example. And this resource ID is telling the website which data set I would like to access. Then I have a second parameter called limit, which is going to just limit the number of, of responses it gets. It limits the number of rows in this data set. And there's an ampersand in between, so that means that these two parameters should be anded. So I'm telling the web browser to access this web point site, ask for this resource, and limit me to five out outputs. Okay, let's see what it gives us. We can click it in Firefox and just see what we get. So what we got was this, which is not very useful if you're not P5. And what I've actually asked for is a website which will give us the location and data about every public swimming pool in Brisbane, which I found on uh, data.brisbane.queensland.gov.au. And in fact, Firefox is smart enough to know that it's JSON and it can let us either print it in a sort of more pretty way or give us this kind of interface to it. So I know that it's a big object now, which has the results here and it's got five records and here's the first one, which is Acacia Ridge Leisure, Leisure Center. I'm sure it's a very fine swimming pool. I don't know where that is, I, except I suppose it's in Acacia Ridge. We've got latitude and longitude, so we could make a map of this if we wanted to, if I ever figure out how to do it. But this is a API. Suppose I wanted to get more data. I could get 10 bits of data this time instead. Get 10 fields. So I've now got 10 records. So if you, if you are happening, if you're thinking I'm gonna make a major project about swimming pools in Brisbane, then maybe this is like major day. Um, <laughs> you probably weren't, but um, it's, it's, you know, I can dream that I'm that relevant to your major projects at this point in the course. Um, I'm going to show you a, a few examples of where you might be able to get a API from or how you might be able to find APIs and how you might use it in processing. So big picture here, web APIs are a programmatic way of getting information from a website. Programmatic means it's you can get P5 to do it for you. So here's how you hit an API with P5. Here's how you get the data into your, um, your program. So I'm gonna copy this in. Um, we use this function called HTTP get. And there's a little bit of weirdness here. I've got my URL to hit, which is actually some data from the ACT. 
a little bit of weirdness here is that HTTP GET, one of its parameters is actually a function which is defining what to do with the data once it's downloaded. And this is a bit weird. It may not make much sense to you why we do it this way. Why can't you just say data equals whatever HTTP gets? JavaScript is just, or uh, well, many programming languages um, can have issues when you get something from the internet which takes time. And even though we may think it's fast, it's not fast for the computer because the computer wants to go to the next line of code. So what we often do is have some way to cope with this. And in this case, um, HTTP, get, HTTP get is set up so that it can run, make the request, then let P5 keep doing other stuff. And then when the request comes back, it runs this code. So in computing, computer science, we call this asynchronism. So there's some asynchronous code to run here. Um, if you're a computer science major, you'll run into this when you're doing 2300 and 2310 in the second year. If you're not a computer science student, then just try to hold on. <laughs> it's just pretty weird. But we can use this. I'm just gonna give you a demo of what this data would look like. Getting rid of that. Again, I'm putting this into preload because I want it to be loaded before my my sketch runs. And I might just print data zero. Oh, it didn't work. Oh yeah, because it's asynchronous, I can't do that yet. <laughs> the setup is actually running before that data is downloaded, so. Download, it's working, it's, it's uh, doing its thing, but if um, data, this will only work if data is not null. So if data has been downloaded and set by this function, that will be true. If data, print data zero. So it's printed a lot of data. I'll tell you what this data is in a minute, but I'm just gonna show you the first thing. Oops. Oh yeah, it's doing it over and over again. Oops, no loop maybe. Just print one object. in here. Print the object and then do no loop. Boy, P5 can be a pain sometimes, can't it? Okay. So what this data actually is, is a record of how many different trips there were on all of the buses and trams in Canberra. So all of the public transport network. And we get a different number every day. Um, and the data is a big list of all the days. So yesterday would be data one. Today was data zero. It turns out that the current day is not accurate. I think it gets updated at the end of the day. But yesterday, we know that there were six and a half thousand light rail trips, uh, 13,000 local bus trips, 243 peak services, 13,000 rapid services. Obviously, the rapid bus services are very popular. And almost 5,000 school bus trips. I don't know why those numbers are so low. Peak service 243, other 353. They probably don't mean what we think they mean. But definitely a lot of public transport trips in Canberra. So how did I find that data, right? <laughs> there's actually, if you wanna make some art with data, make some data art, there's lots of websites, particularly government and scientific institutions that will have a public API that you can hit with P5 and grab some data into your code and do something with it. So there's even so many of these that there are websites to help us find public APIs. So one is data.gov.au, which is kind of a federal level, the whole of Australia um, way of finding public APIs. 
There's also just the local government version of that, data.act.gov.au, which I found more useful actually. This is really, really cool. Uh, so what I did was went and found some data, click find data, and I'll just search for public transport. And I found public tra passenger journeys by service type. And that was a data set which can be hit with an API. Now, where is it going? There we go, there's my data set. It seems to be a little bit slow. Maybe there's some issue with their servers. So, so far, this looks like a, a website and not an API. But thankfully, we can jump down here and find the actual data. You can actually just see what, what things were looking like yesterday. And, oh, here's the API button. If we hit API, we can find the API endpoint. That's the, the website. And use that in our P5 code. So if I load that directly in, uh, copy, load it directly in Firefox, we can view it. There we go. It gives us the same view that we were looking at before, the same type of view. But of course we want to use it in P5 for something cool. If you're into this idea, one, one thing you can do is, which is quite fun, is look at data from um, galleries, libraries, and museums, GLAM sector. There's a Australian kind of GLAM sector um, team, I don't know who it is making this, but they're, they're listing different APIs and giving you lots of ways of finding the data. So it'd be really cool to make art out of art in some sense. Uh, so here's my little uh, practical demonstration. Um, I suppose what I want to do, I'm now going to go into this demonstration. I'm not going to make a mistake this time. So I've now loaded my data and I want to somehow visualize, visualize how many, um, how many people are taking different kinds of public transport each day. So uh, maybe you can hear the baby in the, in the background. The baby has arrived. Baby has landed. Now get rid of that no loop. I'm going to make a make fill invisible and oh yeah I'll make background 255 background white and then I'm going to create an ellipse for uh, one of these data points. What I might do is make a variable to look at which data point I'm actually going to look at. Var points equals zero or something else. I think point is a function in, in uh, P5. I don't want to overwrite that. So rather than print it out, or I suppose I could print it out, points and point plus plus. That means add one to point. So now my it's going to print out every once every frame, print out one data point. I'm not going to do that anymore. Instead, I'm going to make an ellipse based on the number of passengers. That will change the size of the ellipse. I'm going to make it right in the middle of the screen so we can't miss it. And its size will be var l size equals data point dot um, light rail. That's going to be the bit of data I want. And I might divide it by something so that it actually looks good on the screen. So what have I got here? I've loaded my data up. I'm waiting until it shows up in that data variable. If it's not there, I'm not going to draw anything. If the data is there in the variable, I'm going to start drawing the, uh, the data out in an ellipse. I'm going to put in here, the si use the size of that ellipse 
to represent the kind of data I've got. And this is going to be my little program. Okay, oh, here it is, it's working. I might just make that a little bit bigger. Not divided by 100, maybe divided by 25. Okay, so every day as we're going back in time, it's finding a new piece of the data to go back in time and drawing an ellipse. And I suppose when the ellipse is small, it might be a weekend, and when it's big, it's a weekday. And because we're going back in time, I think you can see this is now. Maybe now it gets a little bit smaller. That's probably when everyone was on lockdown. And then this is like last year before the pandemic. So obviously the public transport system has been hit a bit by the pandemic. There's not as many people using it. And the tram hasn't been around for all that long. So now once point gets sort of longer than the, the data source I have, it doesn't work anymore. So what I might do is make point plus plus, point equals point modulo data dot length. I had an idea for this before. I've forgotten what it was. Oh, sad baby. It should keep looping now. There's pandemic, there's the, the good times, and then it keeps going around. Okay, it does keep going around. So maybe we could use visualize two kinds of data here instead of just one. We've got light rail, but we might take, uh, make that light rail size and var um, school service dot points dot it was school underscore service data by 25. So this one's going to be there, light rail size for the x dimension. Okay. <laughs> so there's typically been more light rail journeys than school journeys because the the height is smaller than the width. But at the moment, it's kind of a circle, so they're both equal. So there's a little bit of data art using a live API. The great thing is now I, I haven't downloaded anything. I haven't used any assets. I can put this on P5 Live, which I might do. Um, Editor.p5js.org. And it will work. So I'll share that with you folks later and you can have a go by yourself. Now, there's a, an example of that code or some similar code that I made yesterday. So here's what you folks have to do. You need to start your major projects. The first thing to do is to fork the major project repository, start some aspect of your major project, commit it to GitLab, bring it to your lab next week to talk about. I will be pinging people on the forum if you have not forked your major project this week. I will be pinging people on the forum if you have not made a commit to the major project by the end of Sunday, by Monday morning. So make sure that you understand that you do have to do that this week in order to, to complete your visual diary. Um, it's going to be good for you, even though you maybe feel like you don't want to get started now. You like to do your assignments at the last minute. Unfortunately, I like you to do your assignments regularly in small bites until the deadline. So that would be better for your learning. It will be better for your outcomes in creating a good assignment. It gives you many chances to talk with us, your tutors and your fellow students about what works in your major project and what doesn't. So time to get started. Um, that is your to do for the day. There are some further reading of things to do with um, um, things to do with data and uh, data art. I've got a few links here. Ben has just asked in the chat whether the commit is due Monday AM. It's not due Monday AM for everyone. Your visual diary is due at the, at the same time 
that it was whenever. It's due just before your tutorial starts. So if you just finished this tutorial by on Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, you have until next Wednesday morning to do that. But it really won't take you very long to make a start. I'm just saying Monday morning because when people do most of their work is on the weekend, I suppose. <laughs> but that's I'm not going to mess with your your uh, schedule. What you don't have to do this week is a, a normal visual diary. This is your visual diary, getting started with your assignments and making some aspect of it, no matter how small, right? I don't even mind if it's very simple. If it's simpler than um, what you were doing with assignment one, just making a static image, but some aspect of your assignment, get it started. I think um, those commenting in the, in the comments have already started their major project because I know they are because they're asking about it on the forum. So those asking who've already started, you're well on the way. You just have to write a little bit about it, take a screenshot, put it on the forum, and you'll be good. That's all I'm talking about. This has been my week 10 lecture. I am very pleased to answer more questions in the chat. Uh, I'm pleased to answer more questions on the forum. On Friday, you'll be hearing from Tony about more about the artistic side of data art. Uh, but for now, I will catch you next week. See you later.